Hi, Spots fans. This is another edition of Where Are They Now? Tulsa's own Mike McGurk. Welcome today. Thank you. Uh, everybody knows that you're part of a wrestling family. Your dad, Leroy McGurk, was a uh, very famous promoter in the uh, Midwest. And usually the first question we ask people are, is how you got started in the business. But it's obvious with your father being Leroy McGurk how you did. But take us back and tell us about your early memories of your father uh, being a wrestler, or even if it was your, as a promoter, your early memories of, of your dad. Well, I never got to see my dad wrestle. My dad had lost his sight in 1951. I was born later than that. Um, so it, how I got started, I was raised into it. Um, him being a wrestler, him being also a collegiate wrestler. And this was not a profession that he thought he was gonna go into. He uh, majored in uh, psychology and journalism. Uh, his major was um, journalism with a minor in psychology. So I pretty well had a tough game right at the bed, uh, right at the start. He was offered, um, he, was, he went right to work out of college uh, for the newspaper in Tulsa. And a promoter named Sam Avey, Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, a promoter of sorts, he, he uh, was handling hockey and then uh, was going to start this professional wrestling. And uh, he approached my dad watching and following his college career and uh, he said, how much you making? And my father replied, $25. This is a month. And uh, he said, how would you like to make $25 a week? He left the paper and his wrestling career started. So that would be in 1934. And uh, in fact, in, in Tulsa, people will know that uh, uh, Tulsa World celebrated their first 100 years about two years ago. And my father was included in that because of the diverse um, professions that uh, have, have passed through the halls of Tulsa World, and my dad was one of them because he, uh, he, he, he fully intended to become uh, involved in journalism. And until the day that uh, he closed the doors and uh, sold out to Bill Watts, all the stories, anything that was ever talked about, ever written about, um, was through my dad. He, he did all the bios, everything. So his journalism followed through his wrestling career. Anyway, I'll fast forward up to uh, how I came into it. I was, uh, I was just explaining earlier that I was supposed to have been a boy. He was hopeful that I was going to be that, that uh, boy wrestler that came along. It did not happen. I was uh, named Timothy Michael. Um, and there's a newspaper article in the archives that says, um, McGurk baby still unnamed after three days. So uh, it was going to be Pat. There was uh, several of the names that were tossed around. My dad was coming in uh, off of a wrestling show. And I hear that um, uh, he has this, that he came down the hall with this huge bottle of Chanel for my mom. And, and they were still, you know, my mom didn't know what to name me because Leroy hadn't, you know, Leroy's got a namer. So he said, hell, her name's Mike. My dad's name is Leroy Michael. So there's where the Michael fits in. So I became Michael. My mom took uh, the Kathleen and here you go. So I was always supposed to have been a boy. I was always supposed to uh, uh, have been something. Um, but I, the, the one thing that I really wanted was uh, to be approved by my father. And um, so it was a struggle from, from the get-go. He had a ranch out of uh, Claremore, Oklahoma that I loved dearly, but back in the 60s, uh, as I grew older, um, wrestling was, was uh, not so accepted as it is nowadays. I went by Kathleen, which a lot of people out there know me as Kathleen McGurk uh, during my school years, um, because Mike was, was always associated with, with wrestling, or, or I was so embarrassed of it. I mean, you, you're trying to be somewhat female and Mike in the 60s just didn't it didn't it didn't work <laughs> you didn't have many dates with your dad being a promoter and then you know and named Mike so Kathleen still didn't work because anybody that said it was wrestling fake uh, he, my dad would be the first one on all fours ready to take him down needless to say they vamoosed and uh, I didn't have uh, many boyfriends Tell people that, you mentioned your father lost his eyesight, mm -hmm. but tell people uh, what happened that caused him to lose his eyesight. Well, there's several stories. Um, um, there's uh, been somebody that's uh, wrote a book um, about my father's eyesight. I was always raised and told that my dad lost his uh, first eye, and it was kicked out. 
um, like when he was 11 or 12 years old. They were at a swimming pool and he was waiting to, to dive out. There were these steel rings that, that one could catch as you went out on the diving board. As the, as the fellow ahead of him went to grab the rings, my dad was fooling around, I guess, you know, he was 11, 12. Um, as he was looking around, um, I guess not paying attention from what I gather, the kid that was out there grabbed the rings, got scared, did not release, and he came back and his heel hit my dad's eye. Being from a poor family, which he was from a poor family, um, that's what, and, and to the technology, I mean, we're talking about the 20s. Mm -hmm. um, if something's broke, you take it out, and they took, he, they took it out. That was where um, my dad became a little tougher, um, being a, from a poor family, being an, uh, 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 an only boy out of a family with three other girls, and they called him Buster, so, uh, and I, I, I've heard some of the clothes that they used to put on him, so he, was, he had to be pretty tough. But the only sport that would take him was wrestling. He wanted to be a ball player. He loved, he loved all kinds of sports, but uh, he wanted to overcome this, um, this blindness. And of course, being one eye, you can imagine um, what, what kids would do even back in the day. So he became pretty tough. He was already street smart as it was. Plus wrestling was what took him on into college. And he, uh, he went for five years, <laughs> but his wrestling career um, was what really um, made him. Um, the journalism, the schooling, everything, but he, he uh, was Lamba Chi Alpha, uh, Lamba, Lamba Chi Alpha. And then he became president of that, but he, he, all these accolades that he did um, was on his own. And despite, that's what I always tell anybody that has any kind of, of a blindness or any kind of affliction that's been dealt to them, you have a choice. And, and uh, he, he, he was going to fight it, and he did, all the way to um, succeeding in his college career, uh, going on to work for the, for the newspaper, and then wrestling with one eye. He used to tell me that um, with his glass eye, and again, we're talking, you know, the 30s and the 40s, and an eye, you know, wouldn't fit. You, they just gave you X brand, and it was, was put in. And he would be in the ring, and it would fall out. Um, that, that's, you know, you, show must go on. Sure. Um, so it, he, he continued with that and, and he loved the junior heavyweight. I remember um, so much growing up how he loved his, the collegiate. You know, he, this was a living, professional wrestling was a living, but the collegiate was his life um, because it was, it, was, it was raw nerves, raw steel, raw kids fighting. Um, it wasn't um, uh, showmanship. We didn't, we didn't have what we call the word that they do now, but it was um, any time that anybody asked me, it was, you know, it was called showmanship. But he, that's, that's, he then, in, uh, he had wrestled a uh, championship match in Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I understand that he had left there with a fellow uh, and, and had gone to uh, Conway, Arkansas after hours. And uh, on the way back, um, they had uh, run into a, um, a, uh, a drunk driver, um, and then uh, they collided head on. My dad was in the passenger seat, and he said he can remember the uh, glass coming through and um, hitting and taking his good eye. He always wore sunglasses. Um, there's, been, there's been another story that's out there um, about that night, but um, I'm going to stick with the story that was told to me and that I was raised with and that I know and it was documented. Um, there's, people can theorize, and especially if you're in the public eye, uh, a lot of things are said that are not true. Um, me being close to my father, and this is, this is a story that I know and this is the one that I respect. Um, he did not lose his sight immediately. Um, he said it was within about a year that he, he, he told me that it was like a curtain closing and, and I, I can't imagine here you, you know, have gone <laughs> with one eye or anybody that has afflicted with one kidney or anything else. You only have one left. And then this one is, is leaving you. But he said it was like a curtain closing and he, he knew, 
not only was that curtain closing, it was closing on his life um, and, and all, the, all the, the, the living that he'd made. What is he going to do? How is he going to make it? It was, it was actually the sun, he was said he was wearing sunglasses when the he accident, was. Mm -hmm. so it was actually the sunglass part that broke into the eye? Or? They feel that the, the impact, and, and really uh, I'm sure that that had a lot to do with it because he remembers picking glass out, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and it, consequently the bad eye was never, was never touched, wow. never broken. So he, he uh, we went through years of uh, trying to explain that maybe, um, it, I think when he passed that I had such a hard time with it that uh, he always felt that he wasn't worthy um, either, you know, of, uh, uh, of uh, being saved or, you know, where you're going to go. And, and I really felt bad for him because he, he had such a tough, uh, a really tough time. And, and uh, I had about three days and I was pretty mad at God for a while sure. um, because I, I adored the man. I, I, it took me a long time to understand him um, and probably him to understand me because he kept me at a distance when I was younger. And I, I only now come to terms with that. Were you his only child? I was. Well, I, no, I will say out of the union of my mom, which was Dorothy, um, he had been married before and, um, and he has a daughter that's still alive, Cynthia, somewhere. Um, and that was why he really didn't want a child because he, after, freshly after he was blinded, he came home um, unexpectedly and uh, uh, this lady, uh, there was another man in there and he said, I knew there was somebody in there, kid. I knew there was somebody in there and he went after him. I think from what I heard, she went out the back door, out the back bedroom window and uh, uh, he grabbed him and uh, he called his attorney and told him, he said, I, I think I've killed a man. Hmm. Because that was instinct for him. He had just come home, freshly blinded, and uh, your wife is with somebody else. That ended up in divorce. So when he saw and met my mom after he was, after he was blinded, he, he really didn't want a child because there was one out there that, that uh, was from, a, you know, in the 50s from a broken home. Um, several attempts happened, and so uh, this one came along. I don't know, I slipped through the cracks somehow. <laughs> you mentioned he didn't lose his sight right away. How, how, how long did it take? He said it was about a year. He, right. they, um, he went to... Uh, did he ever wrestle after the accident? Because I, I know he not, stopped wrestling after. You know, that, that is a, a gray period for me. Um, I don't really know. Um, I, I, I understand that he went to Johns Hopkins uh, hospital and um, there was an event there that I mean he and he did he said uh, my life is over how, how am I gonna how am I gonna be Larry McGurk and how am I gonna make a living and um, they caught him story has it and he said that they caught him trying to jump out of the window he was he was going that was it and uh, they I, either he he caught himself or they stopped him and um, they uh, Psychiatrist told him, he said, he said, Leroy, he said, um, if you could change places with anybody, he goes, literally, change places their whole life, would you? He sat, he thought about it, and he said, you know, I've had a pretty good life. And, uh, and, he, and, and they said, well, you still do. I think he, at the time that he was um, 40, Let's see, 51, let's see, he said he was born in 1910, and then he told the other people it was 1912. Us McGurks have a problem with dates. <clears throat> never tell them your, never, never tell them your age, kid. So, <laughs> X, so don't say X's tell you that. Don't tell us that you were born in 1974. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Right. <laughs> but he, he, he had a, a, a real, uh, a real reckoning there that he, he said, my God, maybe, maybe I can do something with this. And I think at that time that they told him, and, and he had relatives from his, from his family down in Texas that said, money is no object, how can we, can we save this? And there was no way. From what I understand, the technology was not there, but the retina had detached. So there was really no way of, of, um, of, of saving it. Mm -hmm. You're blind. So uh, he, he didn't want to be a blind person. The only thing that I always remember, and he never seemed blind to me 
ever. Um, because he could look right at you. He, he would look right at you. Um, and you could walk into the room and he could look at you. And, and I always remember the wrestlers from Dick Murdoch to anybody, you know, he would, you know, you could watch him. He goes, let me feel of you. And, and he could size you up. And of course, people could make something out of that. But he, he you know, you could see his facial expression, skinny leg, pot belly, you know, god damn. You know? <laughs> So I, I and so that was that was my dad. But you it, and you could see the facial expression because back in his day, from a junior heavyweight, you trained, you were. You know, and he was physical even with uh, the Alzheimer's that he had. Uh, he was still physical. I, I remember seeing my dad always working out, always swimming, um, always walking. Uh, the leader dog. Um, the only thing that he did do that was in braille was cards because he loved cards. So when he played. Uh, uh, his his poker game or anything else, he truly had a good poker face. But he could sit there and he could, and then put that hand down. And it was like, wow. I had no idea, but just by his face, I'd have, I'd have turned him in. You know, he's not. <laughs> but he, he, he walked his leader dog, um, and he became a, a big supporter out of Rochester, Michigan for uh, the uh, leader dog school of the blind. And as a little girl, I always remembered that that was, you don't, you don't uh, bother the leader dog. Once the harness comes on, that, that meant work. Um, but that was, that was work, you know? That was something, when the, when the harness came off, that still, that was the leader dog. And every one of the leader dogs that my dad had was buried at the ranch. When, you know, they, they don't, they, they go to the ranch. And, and then they were barricaded so that the cattle would not stomp on the leader dogs because they gave him good service. Mm -hmm. His first one was Sam, named after Sam Avey. And uh, I have pictures uh, of me as a little girl with this leader dog, and the dog was very photogenic. <laughs> it was more so than I at the time, but uh, I mean, he went everywhere, but that was my dad's first. And uh, the rest of it, he had a talking book. He was a really well-read man. Um, uh, I would hear, of course, he was, you know, from the wrestling world, we, we stay up at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would hear sometimes two, three o'clock in the morning, and we hear this droll voice, and it would be his talking book, which was a, a, a uh, any kind of books, any kind of periodicals, any kind of magazine that was recorded on this 33 and a third, and you got him out of the U.S. Library of Congress, and, and he would play that, and he would always be something, he was so well read, and he always wanted to be in, in conversations and, and included in it because he, and I can't imagine later on that I would sit there and I would never think that he ever thought anything about him being blind, but he, he, he absolutely wanted to be a part of it and, and to be up, up to speed with the news and what was going on. So he would, he would read these and he, he would, if he, he had a good, if he had run onto a good book, he would and he could wake us all up and, you know, he, God damn, I'm hearing, you know, it's a really good book. And as a kid, he, he, I never knew, like, being a child around my father. He uh, exposed me to so many diverse cultures. And at the time, the wrestlers um, and their children, because they came in and we had territories. And these families came and lived, you know, in, uh, in, in the Oklahoma Territory. And, and, you know, I had pizza before pizza was, was famous, you know, it's because... Spider Al Galento would came in, and you know, a pizza pie was, you know, it was out of a pan and thick, and the kids, and and uh, you know, I, I thought it was pretty cool when you were Spanish and you could drink wine at five. <laughs> <laughs> I like this, <laughs> so, yeah, it, but he, uh, I, I never was uh, allowed to be like, excuse me, uh, like a, uh, like a kid. He always uh, laughing was, you know, there it was. You, you, you just didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I was from uh, an only child that I knew of because I never knew of the, of the other sister till later. So it was my mom, and my mom was very devoted and dedicated to my father. I mean, besides the dog, she was my seeing, you know, she was his seeing eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and, you know, day in and day, day out, that was business. So uh, it was. It was, uh, it, was, it was quite entertaining. How much of a, of a lag time was there when he stopped being a wrestler and became a promoter, which a lot of people know him as now? Very, very quick. As I said, um, when this happened and they told him that 
he was not going to be able to wrestle anymore and that he was losing his sight. I don't know how many matches. I know that he, they held a tournament um, for the junior heavyweight belt, which Vern Gagne uh, won. And that was, that was something that Dad, till the day that he died, that uh, he, he uh, loved the different area. Of, and, and Vern was a wrestler and then turned into promotion. And they had respect for each other. And uh, you respected that, um, the territories, but also Vern was, was a shooter. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew that he could carry the belt and hold it well, even though that Dad still retained the rights to the junior heavyweight belt. So I'm not really clear because, again, I wasn't born. I, I wasn't told too much about that, that gray period, about how long and, and, you know, how many did he wrestle after that. I really don't know. I really don't know. I picked up, you know, a little bit later. Um, I, I was told um, that he used to have Memphis, and, uh, and that was a part that, that Sam Avey had, because you didn't have television. Remember, we're in the 50s, so you, how have they designated these, these yeah. territories? Give, give us a landscape of what, what were the territories when your father took over as a promoter? Well, he had, he had Memphis, we had all of Oklahoma, we had the eastern part of Texas. We had all of Arkansas. Um, Louisiana came into it, but that was Louisiana, all of Louisiana, all of Mississippi, the south western part of Missouri. So we, at, at, uh, at one time, we had two towns a night running, seven days a week. And it was, so you, we, had a, we had a territory that lived down in Baton Rouge uh, and, and took care of the south end. And then you had the other territory that lived could live in Tulsa and then carry and do the Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Little Rock, Springfield, all the while that you're running Shreveport, Monroe, Alexander, um, New Orleans, your spot shows. Um, I mean, that's an enormous business. It's enormous. And, and, and then so. I, my dad used to tell me, and I mean, this is 59, 60, I think even maybe 58, that uh, they came, the television came to my father. Mm -hmm. and asked them I mean, if they wanted to put a product on the show. Well, then years later, we were paying them, but before, they were paying us mm -hmm. for the product. So, yeah, and of course, Dad said, oh, my God, television, how are we going to do this and protect the business? And then what we called bicycle the tapes, because we didn't, you know, we didn't have satellites, so we were running an angle all the while, you know, and maybe in the Northern Territory, bicycle the tapes and then run another angle with a whole different group of people down south, it took, uh, yeah, it took, uh, it took some doing and to not smarten the people up. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that. You couldn't, you know, you were still at the world, uh, let's see, what is it, kayfabe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the kayfabe promotion? Yeah. But I, I, I'll tell you this, uh, my father never, ever, ever smartened me up. I was 18 years old, and it was somebody else that uh, told me that, and uh, and it really, it, he was really disappointed the fact that uh, that I'd found that out. First of all, it was Santa Claus, and then it was the business. So, you know, he he uh, he, and it, it, that is the truth because he said, "What smart son of a bitch smartens you up?" You know? <laughs> um, whoops! Better not give that name out because he really he did not have any intentions for me to be in this business. It. Uh, as, you know, I, 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 I went through a period that uh, I really didn't like it. I think I told you, you know, that uh, I, uh, I went to a school that held doctors and dentists and, and professional people, and then comes Leroy McGurk's daughter. I was like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, circus. What kind of living did uh, your father provide? I mean, were you an oh. upper middle class family with the. We had a 2,860-acre ranch that was paid for. Um, everything that my, my family had, he told me, if, if, you, if you can't pay cash for it, then you don't, we don't have it. So everything we had, we paid, for, we paid cash for. I n never knew what that meant until I got older. Um, uh, he was a hell of a businessman. And, I, and that's what I tell for anybody that has any kind of um, any kind of from blindness, any it, from any 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 injury, don't let that hold you back, because I can tell you for one thing that that my dad not only lost one eye but two eyes, and he was smarter than most people, including myself, that uh, was able to 
to make a living from here and make a jump and diversify and, uh, and be very successful as a promoter and, and, and couldn't see. Um, some say that uh, he was not a good promoter because he had heart and a promoter does not have heart. He did, if you had, and he believed in family. He, you know, if, if there was a family member sick or ill and you had to miss a shot. Consequently, a, uh, a partner that he had later on in life uh, didn't agree with that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have, I have, I've seen people in my lifetime, I've talked to them lately, um, that uh, maybe their stories might differentiate from what I know who my dad was and, and what I've seen. Well, every wrestler we've interviewed, and when they mention your dad, it's always how generous he was. Good. Well, so, yeah, <laughs> that's that's pretty consistent, and, and and some other stories we had with how firm he could be. So, yes, that uh, I will uh, tell you exactly. He could be <laughs> very firm. I never understood. I never understood why my friends, you know, they would have uh, Christmas off. We worked. We worked. We gave away gifts, and my dad remembers being poor as I brought this, started with this interview. And that was why he thought, when, if, they, if these people are going to pay money to come in on Christmas and watch a show with their family, um, and then I'm going to give Chatty Cathy's out, the English racers, you know, and I would sit there as a spoiled kid. I didn't think I was spoiled at the time, but I thought, well, how come they? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and I understood what that was about. It was about giving, and he was about that. There was never a child. Um, or uh, um, uh, still an animal, that's why I still have animals like I do today. But anybody that came to our door, my dad would not turn away. Wouldn't do it. And if they could come to the door, he's not going to turn them away. He must have given you some odd jobs as a young daughter of his, being a family business. What is the earliest you know, family job you can remember? I sold programs. At you bet. Age? I hawked programs. You bet. My mom sold tickets. Mm -hmm. um, well, the earliest job, but it wasn't the job. Uh, my mom was uh, at the Cimarron Ballroom in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, my mom selling tickets, my dad running the back and, and uh, talking to the wrestlers. Um, and, and somehow I, I figured it out long ago that I needed to be in the ring and I was about three or four years old. and. Somebody said, Leroy, Dorothy, your daughter's in the ring. <laughs> and there was not a wrestling going on, but it was during intermission. But I had a, 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 I think it was the wrestling bear or anything, but you know, they were working. And I just went around the arena as a, and I probably broke free, the independent thing that I am. Um, uh, ended up in the ring, and so I can remember being hauled out. And, uh, but you, that was, that was, you know, if, uh, you know, on the weekends, uh, you went to the office, they did their bookings, um, we saw the families, we saw the wrestlers and sent them on their way to the towns, and I spent my time out in the arena, alone, you know, in the dark, uh, looking at the ring and, and uh, looking at the empty seats, and so that's part of the promoter's job and realizing, or the promoter's daughter, um, uh, that you are involved in it. I went through, like, in junior high that I really didn't, uh, I had an affliction towards it, and soon enough that my dad had told me, where do you think that you get the, these things? Where do, you, where, do you, where do you get off that it's, you know, the famous saying, does money grow off trees? Well, hell, I'm still looking for that tree. But no, it, it, was, it was those fans. And till this day, those are the best, still the best people. They are the most loyal. I mean, remember, we held shows that were every Monday night, every Tuesday night, every Wednesday night, somewhere across the country. And they came. Well, if they had to have a baby, usually it was you know they made sure that they had that baby during that week, and they came back that next week, and uh, they were there. But they were diehard fans that supported a wonderful living that I had, and and uh, consequently that brought me into uh, uh, Vince McMahon's view. What are your memories of your, of your father eventually, uh, I guess, rel relinquishing his territory? And, uh, you know, most people know that Bill Watts basically took over the, the territory that your father had run for many years. Let me tell you something. It was just another, another day, and uh, my dad had gone out and he was in the swimming pool, and we had a messenger come to our home. 
and I literally a messenger that uh, had told my parents, um, your things will be shipped to you, uh, the, key, the locks have been changed, um, you're through. Um, this was all pretty quick about the time that Bill had convinced my dad that he needed to take it easy and the points had changed from 49 to 51 and then it went to Bill getting 51 and 49. You gotta understand this man, uh, and I go back to the story we've been talking about, from losing his sight to, to, to absolutely developing a territory, developing a, a life, um, trusting people, that uh, that uh, turned around and uh, told you what you know and changed your whole life. I uh, I don't at the time. I was married to Brian Blair, and um, it, it became uh, we like he said you know I, I can't even imagine. My dad was such a uh, he really didn't he really didn't let on a lot. Back in the day, I, I just know that I saw that day how our lives changed, and how I saw a, a trusting man, and and to see that that he was reflecting over, oh God, 28 years. I guess Bill had. I remember as a little girl that they used to do publicity shots at the ranch. I still have them where they would bring this cowboy Bill, and they would stage him and and have this Hereford cow or this calf and have him put a knee down like he, you know, he was Cowboy Bill Watts. Anyway, I know I'm making light of that, but you know, I, 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 I see that and, I, and I, then I see how um, that uh, it changed our whole life. I, I saw how being married early on to where Brian had such a desire to be a wrestler and it was thrust upon him, not only did you are you a wrestler now? You are a promoter's daughter. You are supposed to, and you're supposed to also help manage a ranch, um, and you have to set yourself apart from being one of the boys, and that's that's kind of tough at 22. That's real tough, because he was very young, very young in the game, and uh, of course Jack Briscoe, God bless him, had had told him. He said, well, you know, you might go to Oklahoma Territory and. And, uh, and meet the promoter's daughter. Well, he did. <laughs> was he the first wrestler you ever dated? Uh, no. 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 No, he was not. No. Did your father ever give you, uh, Consequently. basically, an ultimatum, don't date the wrestlers? Because oh. I'm sure he gave the wrestlers an not ultimatum, only, don't date the Not only dog. that, my God, I remember as a little girl coming in and the fans would come up and say, oh, that's the next moolah, or that's the, she's going to be a lady wrestler. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I knew that from five years old on that, you know, that, no, I wasn't going to be a wrestler. Plus, I don't like having my hair pulled, but that's tough. <laughs> we used to have some beautiful lady wrestlers back in the day, and Casey, and, I mean, they had beautiful robes. They were beautiful women. As it went on, uh, and of course, Mula. I had grown up around Mula, which years later she told me, "Don't say that kid." You know, <laughs> don't say that kid. I gotta, you know, don't tell him. Don't tell the boy that. You know, tell, don't tell that guy how old I am. But uh, no, and I knew that. And and it, like I said, I, I went to went to college in Missouri, at William Woods. Came back, went to OSU. So I really wasn't thinking that I was going to go along in the wrestling until this kind of scenario was starting to happen um, as far as I, my dad did. He said, well, come home, because when I was at school at Missouri, gas stations were closed on Sundays, and I was 450 miles away, which was great. <laughs> but he could call the promoter out in, in Kansas City. He called the promoter out in, in uh, um, oh God, St. Louis to uh, make sure that I would be all right. And, uh, but I was always watched upon by this, you know, this larger-than-life family. But when it came to that, my dad was starting to have a, 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 a hip problem. He wasn't being able to walk his dog as much. And what was happening, it was an old wrestling injury. It was uh, um, bone on bone. The cartilage had worn down. And I think it scared him. And they had come up to, to Missouri and said, I want you to come home. Come home and go to OSU in Stillwater, which I did. And uh, I, uh, from going to a girls' college into uh, Stillwater, mm -hmm. um, was just no rules. I wasn't stuffing my bed at 18 years old, and 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 I, so it, it became. I came back home, mm -hmm. and uh, I was back around the wrestling business, and 
And I thought, you know, this is, this is where they were needing some help. And, and it just, I fell really into it that, uh, that's, well, I could use your help. And that was on, you know, to help my mom. And, and, uh, and he wanted me home. My mom said, stay away. My dad said, come home. That was the beginning that I felt that my dad and I were really starting to have a relationship after all these years of being a, a distant that, um, and it was some years later that somebody said, well, you know, I think your dad probably was relying on you, uh, relying on you for, for his eyes. Although I was still a kid, you know, although he still, she doesn't know the wrestling business. And I didn't, and I didn't. Well, I'm just thinking who's crazy enough to uh, date Leroy McGregor's only daughter. Well, that's why I didn't have many. You know, I didn't have anybody in the normal world. Mm -hmm. um, and in the wrestling world, it, uh, it, it took somebody to, to uh, step on out. And as we all know, um, and it's well documented, um, lo and behold, on a Monday night, we'd all get together after wrestling, and uh, we'd go and have beers at a certain place. But that's what you did, you, un you unwound. Well, from the wrestlers that I always knew back in the day, they were much older, older and paunchier, and then along comes a very good-looking, handsome fellow named Ted DiBiase which was a couple years older than I, and uh, uh, we just hit it off. I mean, we, we were kids. We were, we were beginning to understand what second generation was. His, his dad, of course, uh, was Iron Mike, which we had met years ago. In fact, my mom said, you know, it was Ted that tore up your, your stuffed animal years ago. You know, it was five years old. It was, it was, it was, so, it was, you know, he already had a bad reputation of, of uh, tearing up my animals. So, uh, but that's, you know, the families back then got together. So years later, um, I don't know, he, he uh, was married, he, uh, what, but he was separated. And uh, we, one thing led to another, and really it did by just talking, and uh, that we realized there was this new generation coming on. And I just uh, flat fell in love with him, just, just uh, against, uh, everything that was right, everything that was told to me um, that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Although I did say, you, you have left your wife, and he, he had, <laughs> but um, it's a business. And uh, uh, consequently, Bill got in the middle of it. And I think that's where I, I really learned that, um, and I'm still into this What do you day, mean by very, Bill got in the middle of it? He got in the middle of it. He, he, uh, he, he, this is really hard. I usually just, I don't really tell this out to everybody. Um, your life is not your own uh, when you have a partner that is, um, that has bigger designs on, um, on a territory. So obviously I was a threat. When I fell in love with this fellow, Obviously, that was going to be a liaison, and probably something that, that my dad and I needed. That was not to be for Bill. Bill got in the middle of it. He uh, he um, he did come to my apartment. He came to my apartment and he asked how much it was going to take for me for to get rid of me. I said I don't think I understand. And he said, Sure you do. You're a pain in your father's ass. And uh, I mean, I'm, we're going to be just, just, just blunt here, and um, I think that's where the McGurk hit in me, and I said, well, I just think I'll just stick around. So he didn't win with me, so he went to Ted, and uh, he convinced Ted that uh, my dad was on the way out. He brought his ex-wife, no, not, not ex-wife yet, put those two together, and uh, the, I lost the love of my life. But I realized then that, that my personal life was not my own, um, not at least in this. So anything that you do do, that you do, do in this business, you, uh, you, uh, you don't talk about it. Did uh, your dad know about your relationship with Ted? Well, so, yes, we decided to, um, <clears throat> my mother said, well, we need to get this out because the boys are gonna talk, boys talk. They do, and uh, we were meeting each other, and I think um, when, when he would come in and he would get, even get close to Tulsa, then I would, 
run and of course he would say drop me off here boys and I think it just it, we were we uh, <clears throat> got a little sloppy with it as far as meeting mm -hmm. and somebody said well that's Leroy's daughter so it got back to Bill Bill went to my father so then my mom said you got to go tell your dad so we, we had, at the house that we lived in, had four white pillars. <clears throat> it was a colonial house. And my dad, you know, my mom went and got him. You know, this is like talking to Oz, okay? He's, 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 he's just, you just don't come in and say this. He came out to the front porch, and I told him, of course, we were several steps down, and I told him, uh, Dad, Mr. Ted, you know, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, essentially it came down to the fact that we really, we really, we really love each other. And uh, he sat and thought about it. He had a cigar, and I could tell from the way that the sunglasses were and the eyebrows went. And he, he sat there and thought about it. And he's saying, I know, he took his right hand, and he goes, no goddamn daughter of mine is going to be falling in love with no goddamn wrestler. Broke his arm. It was not on Ted. It was not on anybody. It was on the pillar. But although he, you know, he had to explain how he received that uh, broken arm. Had you ever heard the story that, uh, and I'm sorry if I butcher the story that Jim Ross told where he drove, mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm about to say? Well, what, pick it up for me. What, what, what story Go ahead, you, tell me. I, 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 no, I, the accuracy of uh, that your father wanted to shoot Ted. Mm -hmm. Well, the, probably the wrong thing that he ever did was uh, tell a person that could not keep secrets because that was his driver and you know we all know that um, Jim is very talented I'm not gonna discredit him anyway but I can tell you that I remember that he was running spot shows for us for my dad um, back on sawdust in uh, Fayetteville Arkansas and uh, the boys didn't even have a dressing room and I remember saying that that's that's Jim Ross and overalls good old boy but sometimes those good old boys um, get anxious, and uh, I, and I, that's another one that, that uh, I felt that, uh, that turned on my father, because that was something that was, that was, that my dad, you know, when he went out with the boys, that was, that was the boys, and Jim was very eager, very young, and he was his driver, um, and he, he said things now that, uh, um, I re re really, really wished he wouldn't. I don't know if that's if that sells books or or what that does. Um, Ted's alive. Jim's alive. Um, you know, and there's a lot of things that uh, we say in confidence that you know probably in his heart because he knew that I absolutely had fallen in love with the wrestler, and he he knew what kind of life that was going to be for me. Um, I knew too much. Being a promoter's daughter, you know, I was privy to a lot of information. I could, you know, I mean, I would hear things that was not true because you would hear women in the restroom and say things that, and I'd be just, oh my God, you know, and it was not true because, you know, and maybe some of it was, maybe, you know, but my mom always would, would say, just be careful on things that you hear because people will say things that's not true um, trying to better themselves or that, you know, oh, I know so-and-so and the truth would never be found out. Well, you know, I know that my dad was very upset about it. Was he going to kill the kid? Absolutely not. He had too much of a tender heart. And it, I just, I never would believe it. I think when he found that Ted um, hurt me, all, all amongst the fact that he did not know that his his partner had uh, had something to do with it. That uh, um, that I think maybe that was probably because he knew I was so upset, and that was probably yeah, well, that was my first 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 uh, first romance in the business. Because again, I am still trying to to get the adoration from from my dad. Again, I cannot be a lady wrestler, but if I could get connected somehow and marry a wrestler then I'm getting close to something that I know and love and understand so much. And, um, and, and it didn't happen. But it, yeah, that story um, is, uh, and, and it could have happened. Again, that's gonna be up to uh, you know, uh, Jim Ross and knowing my dad, 
we all, us hot, hot blooded Irish people, can usually say something and then we regret it later, but that was not something that, you know. And probably for Jim, being the country boy that he was from Westville, Oklahoma, probably thought, oh my God, you know. Yeah. My dad knew some pretty heavy people. I always know that he could make calls to Kansas City and I don't know, you know, that meant, you know, something. <laughs> that meant the family, you know, so he didn't have to do it necessarily. So yeah, we hear that. So if it sold a book, that's good. You know, a lot of what you described is, you know, essentially the politics of pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you know, it's, a, it's, it's your private a, life is not your own, right? And it was, uh, and it destroyed. It, it, uh, it, it destroyed. A, it killed me, and I didn't. How, know how did that. your father feel about Bill Watts? And I'm sure he was very upset with him at the time that Bill Watts basically stole a promotion from him. But, but years later, what, what do you think he'd say about Bill Watts? Are we rolling? We're rolling. <clears throat> well, Bill wrote a book. Um, I've not read it and I won't buy it. I've uh, hit and missed some chapters. Um, he'd, be, he'd be very disappointed. He would, he would also say the same thing that, uh, you know, you can rob a, a blind, you can steal from a blind man. And he stole from a blind man. He stole his trust. He, um, and Bill Watts. I can tell you uh, as a youngster that I would remember him staying at my house, at my mom and dad's house, two, three, four o'clock in the morning, shoving whiskey, something, and they would drink and drink. My dad would go to bed, Bill would talk to my mom, he wouldn't leave, my dad would get up, and he was literally begging to get back in. My dad, you know, when, when, when he got Bill, Bill was a big guy. My dad had junior heavyweight material. So he sent him to New York because that's where, you know, and again, he was, um, all promoters got along. I mean, my God, we, we shared Andre, we shared the, the heavyweight champion. Oh, that's what we did. But he sent Bill because he said, I can't do anything with you with the junior heavyweights. We wrestle here. All I can do is let you, you tag in, you come in and you, you know, and then you got to tag out. So he made a good name for himself in New York, and then uh, he went on into Vern. But um, he came back and he wanted to play a piece of the promotion. They they came they had formed a, a partnership once. Um, it's pretty profitable. But then Bill um, was putting things up. We, what we were trying to do was what they were trying to do was garner the the talent. From, from Vern to Fritz, because we, we had a huge competition on, on the, the Atlantic Seacoast. We had, you know, the Crockett promotion, and, um, and, and Vern developed talent. And, but we wanted to, to, to hold that talent in and then cycle them so we could send our talent up to Vern, Vern would send them down. So consequently, we had a partnership. Bill got greedy, but yet again, remember the, uh, the, uh, the one that was holding uh, more points was my dad, so my dad took the hit for his partner. And he knows that's true. And my dad had to stand behind his partner, um, although he didn't like it. So anyway, that, that Bill left again. Um, he went to Florida. And then he took Danny Hodge, which was our junior heavyweight. And that, that again killed him because he, he, he didn't blame Danny. Uh, he loved Danny, but he also said that Danny was easily led, and he took his belt and took it to Florida. You know, and, and I, I can't imagine what it would be like for, um, I, I do now because uh, events, and that's what I said, I, I remember, you know, as, as far as promoters and, and your word means everything. And um, so what would he say? A lot of things, but the first thing is that, you know, um, he, that he trusted him. and. Um, he screwed him in the end, you know, and, and uh, it, the only one that did not sign a no-compete clause was me. My mom and my dad signed a no-compete clause because I think he didn't really think I was worthy of doing anything. He discredited me any way that he could. He spit on me one time when I was, uh, I always like to sit out in the crowd. And uh, I think it just needs to be said. And um, I would always sit with the, with the hired help and the people at the fairgrounds or anything. And, and um, Bill was coming out one night, and this was all during the times that he was trying to do a takeover. 
So obviously, you know, I'm sitting with people that are not smart. And they're, you know, but they didn't like Bill Watts. They liked Killer Carl Cox and everybody was coming out. And Bill came out and, and uh, I happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, Bill stopped and he doubled back and he just, and he spit on me. And uh, I thought, and I mean, it, I mean, the people that were sitting with me just, whoa. I mean, this is supposed to be the good guy, Cowboy Bill Watts. But, you know, again, I got to go and do I go and tell my mom? Do I go and tell my dad? Do I let them know that I think that Bill Watts is not happy with me? Do I think at the time that maybe I deserved it? No, because I mean, what? I'm, I'm sitting there and this guy can't stand me because I'm, I'm, I'm the thorn. I really am. You know, I, I, he just wanted rid of me so he could just run over. And eventually that he did, but um, you know, I, I, still, I still was my dad's eyes about if, as far as somebody that uh, is not a good person. And he wasn't a good person. It's odd that uh, with all this that happened and you were at a very young age that you'd be interested in continuing a career in professional wrestling. Which it was inspired. Because inspired. he said, I'd never make anything. Bill said, you'll never be anything. You will never. You're, you're this, you're that, you're this. And I refuse to believe that. Although, you know, I remember I wasn't, I wasn't really close at the point at that time with my dad. But yet there was still a, a dynamic there, I thought. I refuse to believe that. I think he does like me. I think he does love me. Even though, you know, I'm sitting here having this man wanting to buy me off and get me out of here. Um, just, just so it's clear, what were your specific responsibilities as it relates to uh, the territory when Bill Watts took it over? Uh, when that happened? Oh, nothing. I mean, I really just, um, when he took it over, he took it over. Um, no, were you, were you a ring announcer at all? No, at that no, no, point? oh my God, no. I never ring announced in my life. I never sat in the, I never sat, I never, I never sat uh, at ringside. That's what for, was for paying customers. Mm -hmm. You know, the promoter's daughter's out there hawking the programs and then... Just trying to think why, why he perceived you as being such a, a large threat. Because if I could marry somebody, if I could get into the business, or if I could say anything, it was just to get me out of the way. And it really, I think that was the part that if I married a wrestler... Um, but it takes the right wrestler. I mean, you can't just marry any wrestler and that would be that same story. Who spot. knew? I really, I didn't have the business sense at that time. I thought, you know, at that time, it would last forever. Who's going to... I mean, that's not... Who's going to take that over? As that happened, as I saw what he was doing, how he... How um, all of a sudden I said goodbye and put it... Ted on, on a plane, and um, I never saw him again. I mean, um, it was pretty poetic because we'd gone and seen an Elvis Presley concert July 4th, 1976, and I never saw him afterwards. And, uh, and it was told to me in increments. Um, I went down to uh, Shreveport. I thought I was going to meet Ted, like we usually do. Went down there. Ted was nowhere to be found. Um, and lo and behold, Behind the scenes, my mom and my dad were on the way down there to cushion the blow for me. In the meantime, a guy named, uh, a wonderful wrestler, Tom Jones, TJ, was with Ted. And it was all, I mean, it was just, it was so much that I, you know, to, to reflect back on it, how it was handled to keep me away from Ted, mm -hmm. to hold me back to like, you know, I mean, 21 years old. And, uh, I'm, you know, I, what happened? this thing called the wrestling business anyway so you know yeah you get upset but then you you uh, you're gonna fight it so yeah I, then I then I took it on well then um, if that's the way it's gonna be and he's that easily led and easily bought off I don't need that mm -hmm. and I'm here I'm gonna fight it and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna stay with my dad and um, and that's what I what I did I didn't even even when um, Brian came in and Brian knows the story that uh, he came in with Paul Orndorff and uh, word got out. I really wasn't dating him. I'd already had, you know, it's been two years uh, later. And um, word got out that uh, Brian was seeing me. Well, he was canned, Bill Candy. And uh, so I felt for him. I, I felt really bad for him. I mean, at the first, I really, you know, I hadn't, and Brian knows this. I, really didn't like him at first. My mom was pushing this. And she's a really nice kid. 
And um, then it became that uh, uh, I'm not going to let this happen. And I felt for him because here he had come in here and just by befriending me and then Bill being uh, as insecure that I felt that he was, um, you know, let Brian go. So I went down to Tampa and, uh, and um, my dad got him booked in Kansas City and uh, it was Geigel, Bob Geigel and Pat O'Connor. We got him work. I went up to Kansas City with him. I followed him a little bit, saw Ted a little, you know, I mean, from I wouldn't even speak to him. I was so upset. But um, uh, all the while, again, the, the transition is happening with, my, with Bill and my dad. And uh, Brian and I get closer. And, and so I can just tell you that he was, not gonna, he was not gonna rule my life. Brian seemed at the time that he was willing to fight, fight for it, and uh, I think that he wanted to, but the job and the task was, was, was really huge. I mean, all of a sudden, all of the talent from JYD, everybody, what was Bill? You know, I mean, here we are, and, and Dad said, okay, you know, literally, you, I mean, they went to the attorneys, and, and uh, Dad said, take Louisiana, because he felt that if you, if you, Louisiana was such a peculiar territory, you could be in one time and out the next. So he was more secure with holding on with the Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri territory, and, and television. And uh, it was tough for him, because we had real estate uh, in, in, uh, in Shreveport because dad had see dad even got into politics and that was another thing I got into involved with his politics because you had to um, in fact a famous governor I was reading about Edwards my dad would always you'd always pay to both campaigns down in Louisiana because whichever won you'd be in but he made it yeah heck yeah I mean you know I could make a living here and uh, this is you know the only place in 50 states that called parish you know, so, and they can come in and take the house, which they could. And uh, so he said, you know, that's kind of precarious. And he said, I'm going to let that SLB take that, and I'm going to take this. So that's how we became the tri-state area, and, and it was thrust up on Brian to uh, get some talent, PDQ, you know. And, and because we, we had television ready to shoot, and how are we, go, you know, how are we going to compete? Mm -hmm. But we did for a while. And, uh, until we were sabotaged, and, uh, and we were sabotaged. Um, I mean, how can you pay $2,200 for a uh, remote truck to come out and film your television, and uh, they don't have television tape in it? And you just have run a whole program. <laughs> you know, I mean, just little things like that that uh, so, so you had a, a, can kill you. You paid a company $2,200 to come in and mm -hmm. film your TV, mm -hmm. and it turns out they discover after the tapings, I'm assuming, that there was no tape. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it could be an accident. Sure, but uh, when when you have a um, when you got a kid with the last name of Watts that's working for Channel Two in Tulsa, you kind of wonder. You can't. You don't know, but um, you just know that uh, this is war. It's war. We uh, we hired the. Uh, in fact, from uh, Channel Two, we hired the um, the producer that was doing Keith Stallboys, which was fantastic. And he, you know, he knew some of the things that were happening. Um, with it, and we hired him. Said we need you, because obviously, you you learn as you go that uh, we didn't have anybody inside the truck. We had everybody outside and in the dressing room, making sure that everything was copacetic. But uh, well, we got to spend a little extra money and get that director, and and make sure that, that that so not only was Keith working for Channel Two, but he was also working for us as a as a director. So, uh, but it. In the, in the long run, we lost our contract, and uh, we we tried to hang on in 1982. We lost, uh, which is you know, I mean, we, come on, we're talking 80, and and we're we're competing with cable TV, which we had never experienced before, um, and then um, then the U stations happen. I know this for people now that take it so much for granted. Um, it, it, you know, it was such a changing fast pace of time that you have to keep up with, with, with the media and how you get out there. Local was not good enough anymore. And how do you make them change from a 2-6 or 8 affiliate to a U station? And a lot of them then did not have the Okay, antenna. and I know what this, you, you, I, you had to say it twice for me to understand what the U station was, but just because a lot of people here, yeah. they grew up on DirecTV. Describe what, what you mean by a U station. 
that is not what that is is not your your big three ABC CBS uh, and NBC and that's what a lot of your people anybody had um, uh, and cable still was new but especially in your rural areas you had to go and buy a antenna that would allow you to be on a, uh, a different frequency, which was your, your 23, which was Tulsa. But anyway, it was a UHF, so a whole different band. And a lot of those people could not get on that band unless that, you know, you had your big three. So, you know, they were gonna watch, and of course, Bill took over on the big three. And how do we, we, we could still be on Saturday, we could still um, uh, be at the same time slot, but, how do we get them to turn on and, and get a U channel, get tell, you know, how do you get them to do that? It was too new mm -hmm. to be able to go get rabbit ears, especially your good old country boys. Eh, if it's not on those three stations, we're not going to turn it on. You know, I'm not going to bother with it. And uh, so that, you and had If I remember correctly, too, you had to have, uh, sometimes they were making TVs, like the top knob would be the 246 and the bottom knob. And a lot of your, yeah, a lot of your televisions didn't even come equipped with it. Mm -hmm. So... That lasted about uh, three months, and and uh, and, and it, we just weren't getting the numbers, and that's when Bill came knocking at the door and offered my uh, offered my parents uh, yeah, a chance to uh, be happy with what he dealt out to him. Was it a fair offer? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I will never think that that was. I mean, how do you? How, <laughs> No, absolutely. You're not. still really bitter about this. No, no, and you know, no. It, you've asked me, and you, you know, it, the only one that it hurts is me, if I if I'm bitter about it. It's it's the fact that um, it probably was time in the changing of the guard, and um, it's it's just sad that that I feel that Bill Bill could not take my dad along for that ride. He got too greedy. And that's the thing is because I believe in loyalty. I, I believe that I'm from old school and he did not have loyalty to somebody that brought him into the business. You know, I, he has his reasons. My dad, he, he wants to, he, he sells books by saying uh, things that don't pertain to the wrestling business. He got pretty personal about how my dad was towards my mom. And you know, yeah, did they fuss and fight? I mean, if anybody in this or anybody that's listening and you're with a partner 24-7, um, literally 24-7, you know, you're going to, there's going to be some, there's, you know, there's going to be some things that aren't going to be really happy, you know, and, and that they take on more than a role of just being a wife. They've, they've become, um, they've become the whipping post for a lot of things, even though it's not their fault. It wasn't my mom's fault. Um, I got to give her credit. She uh, she uh, she stuck with it all the way because she loved him terribly, and she did have the eyes to see some of the things. And she wanted, she really she would go out and and and, and uh, be friends with uh, Anna Watts, and then uh, and my dad would feel that they would come back. And she and my dad said, "You sold me out. You were going down there and you were talking and telling them their personal you know, personal problems." But yet she was needing, she was needing an she outlet. Needed an outlet right? Yeah, and it just happened to be people that she could not trust. Bill has wonderful kids. Um, uh, Micah uh, just recently had a birthday, and I knew him when he was a little kid. I have utmost respect. We were kids, um, and as far as Bill, you know that it, the bitterness we're, we're taking, we're going back to that time. The bitterness is, is gone. I mean, we we have to. We have to move on, um, and and who knows, you know, who knows. I just feel that I, because the bitterness comes only from uh, how it hurt my dad, how I saw a blind man really cry over over something that he loved and and loved dearly, and consequently, um, um, he never he really never got over. It. How is your relationship with Brian at this point? He is, he is great. I just wish I could talk to him. Um, well, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. how, how is your relationship with Brian at the point where your father 
basically uh, took a check from Watts and left the business. Because at this time, you and Brian were... Oh. I never, I never, I never had anything bad. I, in fact, I stood up April 1st, and he knows that. April 1st was our divorce date, and I said, I don't want this. I really, really didn't. And um, I, I had made some mistakes. He'd made some mistakes. We were very, very young, and the pressure was enormous on us. Um, I didn't uh, want him to go down to Texas, and my dad needed him to take a break and, uh, from the territory and, and, uh, because he needed a, a rest, I guess. I don't know. My dad decided it, and he went down there to work for Fritz. And um, things happen. You know, and and, uh, um, and no, and I, and I really didn't have anything against Brian, and I still didn't. My mom would talk to him, and I loved his grandmother, Nani. I loved his grandparents. Uh, his family was great. Um, again, I didn't, I didn't want the divorce, even when I started working for Vince, and he and uh, Jumpin' Jim were on the road. Um, we got along, you know. He, he was. He, I mean, we went to Hawaii. We, you know, he called my dad. Called Ed Francis and said, "My kid's getting married. Can you book this kid?" And and we spent a month in Hawaii on our honeymoon. So uh, he worked, and uh, I. Uh, it, it was it was wonderful. It, it was a, a great time. The biggest set of flowers that came across uh, when my mom passed away was from Brian. Mm -hmm. I have since. Uh, talked to Hector Guerrero. I've, I've, uh, my son talked to Brian when uh, he was in Tampa, and uh, but I've not got to tell him just how much uh, that you know. Oh, good Lord, no, no. I mean, he he knew that that um, there was never any animosity whatsoever. It was just um, we were awfully young when all this happened, and then later on, as I said, I had finally figured out that not to marry the wrestlers and then I'm going to do it on my own. And, you didn't uh, quite figure it out because no. you, 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 that wasn't the end of all your relationship with the wrestlers. You think? Who's telling you? <laughs> <laughs> Who's been talking to you? <laughs> well, I, I mean, there's a guy uh, that Brian mentioned in his interview that he, he was very upset and he may have described it uh, more so to the way he saw things at the time that, that you guys were estranged. Mm -hmm. I guess you were dating Doug Summers and he came back and confronted Doug. And, and uh, they had a, a pretty, he beat the crap out of him, that's what he said. Do you remember anything about that? Sure do. We'll just let Brian call that one. Yeah. I had only been in the territory for a month or so, and I had met Michael, and uh, we were, uh, um, we were um, kind of had that little eye thing going on. I started seeing each other a little bit. She took me to her house, and. I hear Leroy say, asking for something. All of a sudden, he comes walking out like this. He, he would walk like this, and he had his hands out, and he pretty much knew where everything was, and he'd feel, he'd count the steps. And he came within two inches of me, brother, two inches uh, of, of hitting me that day, and my heart was just pumping. I thought he felt my heart, because he didn't want his daughter to date a wrestler. You know, that was the last thing he wanted. So. Um, uh, I remember that, and I also remember the night he tried to shoot me. You know, that was uh, when I was splitting up with Michael and uh, Kath Michael Kathleen, and um, and uh, she uh, had uh, gotten a fight with Doug Summers that night because I found out that he was, um, uh, you know, the guy was riding with me, and turns around, uh, you know, we split up for a few days, and uh, she was having an affair with Doug Summers. And uh, I found out about that and went into, I was in the office, standing in Leroy's office. I was actually waiting on a paycheck. And in comes Doug Summers. Well, that was the last thing Doug Summers ever wanted to do because um, uh, he, uh, uh, <laughs> we knocked some stuff down on his walls and Leroy had heard about it. And, uh, you know, I was, upset, you know, tears in my eyes afterwards, you know, didn't know what it felt kind of like, what do I do now? You know, I got my boat, my Great Dane, um, my stereo and a couple little bits of clothes, letter jacket, um, and $500. And I had probably left about, I don't 
well, a lot of money. I left a lot of money, I put a lot of money into a house and a lot of money into other things. And, um, uh, I just had that and I wanted to say goodbye to her before I went to the Dallas territory next. And um, I knocked on the door, Leroy came to the door, he said, who is it? I said, it's Brian, and can I, can I talk to your daughter, please? And he said, uh, get the hell out. I mean, he just went off on me big time. And uh, he couldn't see me. He was looking through the screen because he was blind. Now, I did find that out. He was blind for real. And so I was around the corner. And um, he went back. So I went back and sat in my old 72 blue, powder blue Lincoln Continental. And I'm sitting there thinking, golly, this is horrible, man. This is horrible. Uh, I'm going to Dallas now. And, all the times, you know, spent, you know, I start crying again, and I, I go to um, to the back to look to see if Michael was actually in there, and I see this guy laying on the couch that looks like a mummy. I mean, he was completely, there was no face, only a mouth opening and a nose opening, and um, it was uh, Doug Summers, and Michael Kathleen was there feeding him soup and talk about a heartbreak you know that crushed me so I went back around to the front I knocked on the door again Leroy opened the door with the gun and went blam 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 fired his gun I believe it was three times I was so afraid when I saw the gun and the, huh. and the screen door open on I stepped to the side so the the bullets he, uh, went right by his Lincoln Continental tire you could see him he almost blew his tire out, and uh, you could see the uh, like the dirt fly up right up against the tires right there. I mean, he had the bead where he thought I was standing, and if it had I had been standing there, I wouldn't be talking to you today. That's for sure. That's so crazy. I, well, that was very, very trying to listen to everybody that was that could help save my dad's business, and uh, Doug was Doug was one of them, and. I did not use good judgment at all, and, and we were estranged. I felt that, in fact, it was like a race um, to get a divorce. He was like, well, I'm going to do this, and I said, well, I've, I've heard about you, and I'm going to run to the, and it, mm -hmm. we weren't mature. Mm -hmm. We weren't mature. Again, um, things were happening so fast in his life and my life, and I was, I was scrambling to hang on to anything, and I thought, Doug, was, um, and I say that Doug affectionately, that uh, uh, was, uh, um, well, we all make mistakes. Okay. We all make mistakes. But uh, I, I absolutely, that was the, the one thing that uh, you've got to move on and uh, realize that, um, yeah, I did wrong and for whatever Brian did. And, um, and I really don't know what he did. I did wrong and uh, boy, did I. So, yeah. Well, keeping your faith, who was your first contact? I mean, you know, I would probably assume that your father somehow had a contact to get you involved in, the, in WWF, but we had talked about it earlier, and that wasn't the case at all. Not the case at all. No. And I, uh, I, a fellow named uh, John Ringley, that used to be married to Francis Crockett out of uh, the Crockett Territory. Mm -hmm. John came in and great guy yeah uh, was working again when my dad and bill were together great pr man super um and then of course when the split happened john still stayed in tulsa but he got out of the wrestling business and he had divorced francis and was married to a gal in, in uh, tulsa but he still had connections with the wrestling business and george scott um i i got a call my dad and my mom again 1982 we closed the doors by 1983, um, George Scott called, and uh, he said, um, I understand that, uh, that you might have a wrestling ring, that, not, you know, that Bill didn't get everything, and I said, no, he didn't. I said, what the agreement was, was for X amount of rings. He got that. We have won. Never knowing, because the only thing that I had saved that one back for was for 
to be at the, my dad's ranch and that, uh, that we had a wrestling ring left mm -hmm. and that was going to be out on you know out in the front and uh, and, uh, and if dad wanted to get in it work out or you know we'd, we'd get in there and do all fours or whatever we were going to have a wrestling ring we weren't going to let it all go uh, he said well there's a there's a fella that named uh, he said Vince Jr. you may know him I said no but I know senior because back in the days of National Wrestling Alliance uh, once a year we'd always have these meetings a lot of times the promoters would have them in their territories my dad hosted the meeting one time it was in uh, New Orleans another time and, and uh, we'd have them in uh, Mexico City um, but it kind of got pretty popular to go to Las Vegas again when I graduated out of high school we you know that was we, we coincided the uh, let's go see Elvis Presley <laughs> with all these crazy promoters and see uh, and do that but that was what uh, Las Vegas was about but again I had always uh, had met Vince Senior and I went, was privileged to be on one of the meetings with my dad and he said stick around in one of these meetings he said me and a guy he says he runs a, he runs a territory out of New York uh, Vince McMahon Senior prince of a guy my god my mom uh, we still have pictures that uh, I've told Vince that we had and my mom had saved um, uh, I think of one of the Mexico City pictures but he was he was really really a gentleman's gentleman great guy and they served on the grievance committee so be me being you know a girl and and again my dad and I a little bit closer and and I remember uh, Vince senior talking about he said well I got a kid he's Vinny but he's into the television he said he's not going to go into the wrestling but he, he told me about Vince Jr. That was the first time I ever heard about Vinny being in television. And he goes, you know, that kid might be, ha be on to something because television is, is what, the way of where it's going. Way to go. <laughs> way to go. Um, so anyway, well, fast forward. He says, uh, well, let's, uh, let me tell you. I got word that Vince Sr. had died, and it was within months that Junior was on the quest of really mm -hmm. You know, he, he had respected his dad's wishes, and dad was gone, and now it was up to uh, Vinny. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, heck yeah. And he, he said, uh, well, he said, this is going to be a tough one, Mike. He said, because, um, and this, you know, I remember Bill is going very strong with Mid-South right now. We're only a year out of when he, he bought from my, my dad, the company that my dad started. And he goes, it means uh, running opposition. I can do it. We can, I've got, what do I need to do? Well, it, all he had to tell me is it pays this much. Can you be here and you might have a problem with, you know, um, some rings and some sabotage, you know? Okay, never, never really, you know, you don't even think of that. Uh, I'm just thinking of dollar signs. I got, by this time I have uh, one child, a uh, little girl, and uh, I was thinking about, hey, it's wrestling. Bird in the hand with the, you know, two in the bush. I'm not, hey, this is, sure, you bet. Um, and he said, uh, first shot's gonna be in Oklahoma City. He said, he's gonna run in Oklahoma City. Can you get there? You bet. And I can tell you for a fact, the first, the first show that I, that I went to in Oklahoma City, we pulled the, the ring out. The ring had been head, heading back at the ranch in the back 40. Pulled that out, got the mat cover, everything spruced up, and uh, away we went. There was a ring being set up in Oklahoma City. That was not, that was not contracted by what we knew then by WWF. And uh, I was just bold enough and uh, I, I needed a paycheck. Again, mm -hmm. the, you know, the drive of, of, hey, get that out of here. And, I, and it was set from, from what all that we can tell by talking to Pat Patterson. Pat was on the show that day and, uh, and uh, that ring was set to for disaster. And it was meant to for sabotage because obviously this is Bill's territory. He doesn't need it. Just, just for clarification, because I know a lot of times the, the rings were kept in a particular building. Is that is that what you were not talking about? Not anymore. This ring was brought in. Okay. See, but when Bill bought out, he bought all the rings and, and confiscated all of them. I, I mean, literally. So this ring that was being set up before you got there, like this We don't know been, where. It was a boxing ring. It was so it would have been a third party bringing it in. You bet. Okay. And it was set to fail. And, and the building people didn't know. And I said, well, no, I, I'm, I, I, 
And again, I'm not running by paper or anything else. I'm just run, running on a phone call and know that uh, I'm supposed to be here. And if without a ring, we don't have a show. And these people were coming from New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, they got out of there. I, I taught, there was a guy, I can't even think of his name, Scott, but he had worked for, uh, he'd worked around for Bill. And I, and I said, get rid of it. And I said, I'm, I'm supposed to have the ring here. We got the ring set up. Um, told Pat and we told the show it was what was happening and we had a good show went off without a hitch but uh, that was my first inkling that uh, there might be some trouble uh, consequently I'd go into Memphis same thing um, I was told that and was shot the, the ring was going to be shot at and uh, I guess I guess when I would pull in there and they would see a female driving this three-quarter ton suburban with an 18-foot ring trailer on the back of it it kind of took them I didn't look really like ring crew. Um, I just savvied my way in there. I mean, I, the thing that drove me again was you got to have a ring before you have a show, and these people are counting on me. And I've been there, and I've, I know what it's like to depend on a ring crew. Um, did it bother me being a ring crew? No, I just decided that we'd gone full circle and that I was doing something that I, that, that I had no idea where it was going to take me. I never did. The only thing that I, that it, from getting the rain jackets, playing the music, meant more money. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said, yeah. yeah, yeah. But announcing, oh, Lord, no. Lord, no. Not until, and that was the truth, uh, September 12, 1986, when uh, they had a radio disc jockey in there, and uh, Blackjack Lanza was, uh, he goes, this guy, we got to get him out of here because he was doing so much of this, hey, yeah, you know, welcome to Memphis, Tennessee. And he was promoting the radio station. He was not doing anything for the wrestling. Mm -hmm. They yanked his ass out and said, uh, you, in a tux, um, you can announce. And of course, here's all my, all these people that I've known, and, and, and they were my contemporaries. So, you in a tux, so at this point, you were the, just per, the person that the went music. and collected the, the yeah. clothes, and you did the Running the music, okay. and just being professional. Yeah. Never so, so, the, so the tux that we saw you when you were a ring announcer, you kind of wore the same outfits when you were? A little bit. It got adjusted through the years. I started out in a man's tuxedo that I would rent from the tuxedo place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, kind of long in the crotch mm -hmm. and very heavy wool. Um, but it, that was, I thought, well, why not? Give it a little bit of professionalism. And I, I didn't want just the jacket, so I liked the tails kind of, mm -hmm. and the fancy high heels. Um, as we went on, then it changed um, to get a little lighter and we went spandex and, and stuff that we could wash. And it was a little lighter to carry around, but that we kind of evolved in that. But yeah, that was basically how we, we handled it, uh, was do the tux and be professional. Because I always put myself in, in to the spectators, you know, because that's where I'd been all my life, mm -hmm. is in a spectator position, is, uh, well, gosh, how would I like that to sound? And, you know, I don't want it to be all about the announcer, the announcers to do a, a slow build and to enhance the talent and then get the hell out of the ring. Mm -hmm. Well, why couldn't a girl do it? Because obviously that was, and that, and it, that was how it happened. It was um, by by thank you wherever you are in Memphis, Tennessee, caused <laughs> caused me to have a something that I, I really liked. My dad happened to be there. My mom was there. It was her birthday. But they gave you an opportunity, and you had never done this before. Never, never, never. And and you know my background was broadcasting, but still never ever doing that mm -hmm. ever. Mm -mm. No, I screwed up in broadcasting at college, so. Like I said, a cuss word on the very first time I was on the air, so that cut my career. <laughs> but no, that it was uh, that was the truth on how that happened, and it it parlayed into something three years later that uh, I I felt that uh, Vince needed to see what was going on. He he could again 1985, 86, 87. Um, by 1988, uh, Hulk was in a show, sold out show in. Um, uh, Wichita, Kansas. And they had a guy that I just happened, I mean, just one of these things that happened in your life. And, and uh, he was out of, he was the, the brainchild of what we knew as the Sky Camp. They used to fly down on the football fields. And I just happened out of being in Wichita, I had some time to kill, obviously I was getting the ring set up with my ring crew. And I said, well, let's videotape this thing. And that was the idea that I wanted Vince to see. Not only did I want to kind of show him what I was doing, but also to pan and scan around 
you know, the, the building, show him what kind of crowd, because he doesn't have it. Every night the, the, the agents would call and say, oh, we had this kind of show, but he never saw the reaction. He never really got a grip on it. This guy comes out, I told him, I said, what do you think? Um, and he was, uh, you know, he, he, we, just, we just meshed, and he said, really? He goes, to hold somebody's attention, we don't want to go too long. And I said, well, I don't want to film the whole thing because I can't afford that. Um, but I said, listen, I, what I'm trying to do is get something of, the, of each match, me in the ring, bring these people in. But I said, the big, biggest thing we want to shoot is Hulk coming in and seeing the crowd. And, and we're going to send that to Vince, to my boss. He didn't know Vince, just my boss. And he said, okay. And he said, uh, and so he, he said, about 15 minutes. So what we did from the onset, he would he, he'd hear my introduction, let him bring him in the ring, and then stop, go dark. And that was the tape that I sent Vince McMahon. Hmm, gosh, about March of 88. And all the while I'd been, you know, for three years, been telling all the agents, you know, God, I want more, I want more bookings, I want this, I want this, please. I sent him that tape. I get a call from Bruce Pritchard, and he said, uh, you know all these things you've been saying on the road, and been wanting to do this? And he said, uh, Vince McMahon wants to talk to you. And they were just going into uh, WrestleMania, I believe it was uh, two. And uh, he said, I'm gonna, this is where we cut off um, with WrestleMania and we begin you know, our new, essentially a fiscal year. And he said, this is what I, uh, I perceive you as. To do this, I want you in production and this. And, was like, <laughs> and that's literally, he said, this is where you're gonna be, New Haven, Connecticut, um, welcome. But before that, I, I uh, went to Stanford, Connecticut. I went to, uh, I was picked up by Connecticut Limousine, scared to death. My God, I'd never been to New York City, uh, much less to Connecticut. Went to Vince's house. Um, he, he told me this is what he was doing. He was starting with a brand new production studio. I mean, everything was just right there on the cutting edge. It was just beginning. This is what he had in a vision. He said, I see you as this, but he said, for longevity, I want you to work in production and I want you to move here. This again is 88, um, and my dad, all of this was happening so fast. Just, just so I can be clear, the, mm -hmm. the, the period maybe 85 to 88, you were taking rings, oh, you, were doing, you were doing the announcing on every show that no, you were bringing no, rings to? only in the Midwest, it really, in fact. Um, but you were only bringing rings to the Midwest areas. Pretty much, but I also would go, uh, Terry Garvin, which was an old wrestler and an old friend of my family's, um, also a, a former employee, was running and booking the ring. And he knew my desire and he knew I'd be there. Um, he said, what do you want? And I said, as much as you can give me. Because remember, Vince had not um, had those rings built. He did not have those, the, the trucks out on the road. He was depending on, 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 on me or else whoever had a ring in the East Coast. So I, I covered as far as uh, the Louisiana. Um, I covered Minot, North Dakota. I would go out of Tulsa to Minot. Um, I could be in a town, I would be in Springfield, Illinois and drive all night long and go to Bristol, Tennessee and, and lose an hour or gain an hour, however. And uh, remember thinking, one of these days I'm gonna fly. Here's the ring crew, because you're, you're the first on the scene and you're the last to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I thought, oh, they're all comfortable in their hotel rooms. <laughs> and I'm going through the wind and the rain and the snow, and literally that one time we did. And, they, uh, and just to make sure that I'd get there by a two o'clock afternoon show. But I, each time that I did, each time that that happened, I knew I was gaining a little bit of momentum and trust mm -hmm. of, uh, that I could handle it. Again, the announcing was sometimes not gonna be mine. You know, that didn't happen just overnight. I still had the, the ring, I still had the jackets, but it, maybe they had a local guy that, you know, was, was um, favorite or whatever. And finally then it became more of an in-house to where, or more of a package to where, oh no, um, you're gonna get the announce, so. So you mentioned the first time was Memphis, but you probably slowly took other cities over as sure. they did. Sure. And it, you just wouldn't even know when you showed up whether you were going to be announcing that day or not. Really not really. Um, I knew that if um, that I had the ring, and then if if Terry worked it or he would he would know locally. However, the promotions were working, um, whether whatever they deal that they would make, whatever business deal that they would make, um, would involve maybe the local DJ guy that was included. But as we got stronger. 
we got stronger and we were able to say, no, she's going to be the announcer. So this you didn't need the local radio station and, and their staff right. pushing the show. You, right. WWE became so, WWF became so, so big. Right. So okay. contained. Plus the fact, because I knew I could take changes. They couldn't. Um, I, we weren't selling the radio station. We were selling the product of WWE and the talent. F. But um, that's, that's still kind of hard to get used to. But. Yeah, you never knew, and so it, it really was a growing. And then, and then when that happened on national television, um, that didn't last probably a year. And then Vince came to me and he said, uh, "We're going to take you off the ring." Well, that killed me. <laughs> you know, from a from a gal that's used to that kind of ring money, um, you know, I, I but I, he said no because we are we're, we have an image. And I said, "That's okay, Vince." They don't know me when I'm coming in there. I can't because I would come with no makeup on and sweats, and I said they. I really make this transformation, you know, in the dressing room with the makeup and the big hair. No, nope, no. Nope. So, and two again, you got to remember he is building, uh, has his rings built, and and I, you know, that was something he needed to do, mm -hmm. and the trucks were coming out, and he had. Uh, his ring crew and the television was growing so big and he said I really don't want that for you you know he said I you're my ring announcer and uh, not going to be ring crew so I took that as that that was a good thing oh, anyway, absolutely. It, I'm sure it was oh, absolutely. but you know you can imagine from the aspect that I was looking at mm -hmm. and, oh, when, and when did the uh, the normal tuxedos become the, the glittery tuxedos that, uh, that you're pretty much uh, about uh, I started out uh, 88 and then uh, Vince hired um, his two ladies that were from Chicago and uh, they were called our, our sewing girls, which I love them to death. Uh, Terry, you know um, who you are. And um, we kind of had an idea because, I, because of the dry cleaning bill and then the more that work that was happening and I kind of shot some stuff. But Vince was very, very open to that. He, 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 for the first, oh my God, for the first year, I would go up to Vince and I'd ask him, you know, after the show was over, is everything okay? Mm -hmm. And he finally told me, he said, you'll know when it's not okay. But I was always looking, again, for that approval. So I, he really said, just do it. So I talked to the girls and I said, can you make me something? You know, and we're talking, you know, 88, 89, spandex is pretty in. <laughs> And, and I still, so we did something that I could carry. It was lightweight, it was washable, um, and, and uh, I didn't have to worry about a dry cleaning bill and a big, you know, and I could change it out. So we kind of made some different colors and played up with it. So about 89, you know, so I, about a year into it. That, so now that you were driving the truck, the ring truck from uh, building to building and you were traveling like the talent, who who were uh, some of the people you traveled with? I mean, everybody seems to like partner up and like to travel with people. No, you were a loner. Pretty much. That's how and that and and that's how Vince wanted it. He uh, he wanted to set me apart from the talent, mm -hmm. um, and and because I was in in production and it and, and later on that's probably what was my demise that I got in and I love Sherry to pieces, but I was to set myself apart. From 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 everybody and and I understood because that probably was going to be what he was looking for is the longevity and and that he knew that what what could happen um, but no I I, he, he, I always my hotel was paid for my car was paid for it got lonesome a lot because you know you you were you you couldn't be close to the talent um, but yet you know you were you were. You were just by yourself. Were you in a relationship at this time? Oh God, no. That was that. Was, no, 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 no. In fact, that was one of the things that I said. I've been there, done that, Vince. So, you know, you don't have anything to worry about me on that because the boys were the boys then, and uh, that was not the uh, the road that I needed to go anymore. Was there any awkwardness because when you were a uh, ring announcer, uh, Brian was working for the company as well? Oh, no, not at all. No, that uh, was not awkward. Maybe, maybe on his part. But no, because um, he knew I was just uh, hanging on with all that, you know, that to get to where I was, to be able to do this and still sustain and be in the wrestling business, um, and the opportunity for it was, was great. So, oh no, no, not at all. And even with Ted, 
Mm -hmm. It was never that way. In fact, Ted was still working for um, for Bill, and I had started with Vince, and he was asking, he said, what's the company like? And I said, my God, go, go, just go. Because I said, it, it, he's going he's gonna to take this. And, uh, and he'd already taken uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And uh, I said, you, you've never met anybody finer. And that's the truth. I said, he, he really is dedicated to the business. You mentioned uh, Sherry Martell, just briefly. What were you about to say about Sherry Martell? You said it's part of the, the demise? No? Well, I got, I, got, uh, I, got, I got kind of close with Sherry, uh, real close. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes, you know, you, um, you're not supposed to stay those late hours or you're not supposed to party, and, or, or what well, they say party, but, you know, I, I, uh, we needed each other. And Sherry, Sherry had worked for my dad, God, my God, years ago, down in New Orleans, he, she had started with a guy named uh, the hippie Mike Boyette. I didn't remember that. But I she remember, remember Mike that. Boyette. I don't she ever remember, remember him winning a match, but I remember Mike Boyette. Well, well I don't know that, but she, that's how she got started, okay. was with through Mike. But she always remembered my father. So she, she uh, one of the first times that I was taking the ring, I would go up in the back and introduce myself to, to Sherry, and she always had good things to say about my dad. Mm -hmm. And, and to get to know her later on and, and to want to ride with her or to be a part of her, um, and I did, you know. Um, I think a lot of that where Vince did not want that to happen. He wanted me to set myself apart from the talent and, um, because the talent can get you in trouble. <laughs> it just might happen. Not that Sherry ever did, um, but it, again, to try to pay, play nursemaid and try to make sure that you know, you want you want your approval of your peers, and you like these these fellows and these guys, plus Sherry and Sherry was my biggest one. Sherry Sherry was uh, there was uh, no bullshit, uh, and and uh, she knew that from me, and and uh, and she knew she knew um, she knew Doug. That was probably about the oddest part of it was because I had these two children. Um, um, and uh, and that she now, still are, are any of the, the, the you have two children mm -hmm. are any of the, the father of the children wrestlers that we would know this one this one but Doug is not the father Doug, Doug is the father uh -huh. not of not of the son that got no. him uh, okay. no no all right no, 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 no. okay and we're still trying to get him to acknowledge that okay <laughs> we probably won't cover that in this interview but okay the uh, we, we go back you were you were mentioning about Martel. I, I, uh, I, I love that woman. She uh, was, and I think a lot of it were, um, she took care of me. Mm -hmm. um, she taught me things that I would have never, ever known. She brought me into um, the program when um, uh, I never knew if the, she looked at me and it's like, oh my God. And she just would tell me, just tuck and roll because she'd pull my hair or if she, she, she would fix my hair. A lot of times we'd be in buildings a long time ago in the 80s that we didn't have air conditioning in some of these spot shows. So obviously the big hair didn't stand. So Sherry would take it and put it on top here and, and it, we'd spray it. Well, by the time she'd get out to the ring and I'd look at her and I could get that eye contact and I'd like, oh my God, oh no. And she'd come up to me and mess it up. Well, the hairspray, you know, kind of held it, but it just kind of, well, I was their fodder, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Let's laugh at the ring announcer, and I'd have to keep a straight face. And I'm like, okay, Sherry. But we became great friends. She uh, realized that um, I was never as tough as she was and never pretended to be, uh, ever. Um, but that, uh, that, that she thought I, that, you know, she always told me, she was, I think your dad would be proud of you. And she knew that all the guys rallied around me when my dad died, first of them, Bobby the Brain Heenan. I can tell you the first time, because Vince told me, uh, I want to go back on the road because I wanted to be with the wrestlers. And he said, no. He said, your family needs you. And he kept me out for a month. He paid me. Um, I went back out, and the first thing I could do was uh, I saw Heenan. And uh, I mean, they just hug you, and they hold you, and they embrace you, because that's where I felt most comfortable mm -hmm. and most at home, and that I was living what I finally had wanted to do for my dad, and that was being with them. 
you know, and, and, and Sherry, too, Sherry too, so from the time that my dad died in 88, uh, even Vince, you know, they, uh, I, never went, I never made it to uh, Connecticut. Um, we tried, he flew me home every weekend for all that summer. I looked at homes and all the while um, a new disease was happening that they eventually diagnosed my dad which was with Alzheimer's. They first thought it was something with his brain that, uh, that he had an aneurysm and it wasn't that, but by the, but by, they took a picture of it in February, took a picture of it in May and uh, the brain had shrunk. So that was what they were attributing to Alzheimer's and consequently that's what took him. And how many years that he might have had that, I don't know. I don't know. I look back you know, and, and wonder because it just didn't happen. All those, the, the, uh, the thing that was happening two and three years before, maybe, you know, uh, from the beginning of maybe why Bill did what he did, that maybe dad wasn't as sharp as he was, but we on the inside refused to believe it. You know, we, we didn't, we just thought it was just, well, but when, when it came to the, when I'd be out on the road and I'd be gone maybe 10 days and my mom would call and say, your dad can't even get up out from the bed. He, he forgot where the bathroom is. And he was very independent. He'd get up out of the bed, go to the bathroom. He, he swam. He didn't, he didn't smoke his cigar anymore. And it happened so quickly that, uh, and Vince said, no, no. Um, and, and, and when he passed, um, Vince said, just stay, stay in Tulsa. He said, I'm gonna fly you out and everything. Because what he was trying to do was bring me to, to Stanford. Um, and when I was not out on the road, that I would be working daily at the uh, television studio. So there, there were, uh, you, you know, you were, you were just a ring announcer, and uh, there were, I remember uh, an instance where Ter Sherry attacked you. Was that something that Vincent Mann would approve of, or is that something? Probably not. So Sherry just said, I'm going to do this. Yeah, uh, Vince, we were in, uh, we were uh, on the road into, uh, uh, in fact, we were, oh my God, Munich, Munich, um, where the, in the Olympiad Stadium. Or years before, as a kid, that I'd seen, you know, when, when those wrestlers had been killed, and you know, I mean, I, I, all the history's right there, and we're in the Olympia Stadium, so it's a big, huge show. No, Vince was not there, and um, uh, Sherry, and then it was Liz. It was Sherry and Liz, and they were fighting over a chair, and I can remember Sherry looking over at me and saying, "You ready?" We had never discussed this, mm -hmm. ever, and I think that was part of the magic of uh, Sherry Martell. She's not going to tell you. It just if it felt right and the crowd was right, and 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 she looked at me and was like, "Oh God, no, oh no," um, and she just came over. She whispered. She says, "This tuck and roll," and I'm cussing her, you know, all the time. I said, "Oh my God, we're going to get fired." <laughs> Nobody knows. The crowd screaming and yelling. She grabs me. I tuck and roll. We have the mats, and I'm laying there. She's just lay there, and her and Elizabeth are fighting over this chair. And I said, "I hope you two witches." Have, have some kind of control over this chair because I'm the one that's going to get hit on this. It, you know, so it, it was so much fun to be able to talk like that. Of course, to uh, I'm sure the agents, uh, and God knows, but the way they went with it, and uh, nobody came out and, and, and scolded me. And yes, I got scoldings many times from agents. What are you doing that for? Um, <laughs> But that was that was that was that was part of the time that she would do that, and she would never tell you. But that was part of the magic of it that I was willing to work with it and go and, and just stand still and hope like hell that they. Uh, that, and I, they were in control. They was there ever control. discussion of you uh, being involved in an angle more significantly or transitioning to maybe something like a manager? Was there ever a different a different role for you on camera no i had i had wanted that and had uh, admired that and then there was a change when um elizabeth and the randy angle had changed um vince had proposed we were going to do something with uh, ravishing rick rude um and it, it, it i don't know what happened what how that, that fell apart but he had always wanted me to stay apart from that um and of course, ravishing Rick Rude, Rick Rude would come out there and he'd wipe the sweat off and, you know, and he'd try to intimidate anybody he could. My whole take of it was I'm the announcer and, and I'm not about to, to be bold to him. I mean, again, I'm looking at it from, from a fan's point. And all the while that I'm looking at him and, you know, you just want to, you know, we're, we're, we're not friends, but yet we're, we, we work together, but, go for it, go with it, and uh, I'm a prop. 
Um, I never, I never meant to, and never was there to steal a scene. Or mark, it wasn't about Mike, it was never about that. So I had a love for it to work into something, and it just didn't, um, I don't know what happened to Rick, but something happened because of a, we did, a, we did a, a, a program spread on it. In fact, I still have the picture at home where, where he's kind of looking back at me, and uh, Vince had the idea where he was going to come up to me, and he'd already been, you know, so so ridiculing all the women, and, and I was going to haul off and hit him. Um, it didn't happen, but that was where I I want because I told him all along. I said I want to grow. I want to do something, you know. I, I um, when when Randy and Liz were doing the split, um, I was going to um, drive her, and I was one of the very few people that, um, if at all, that Randy trusted with Elizabeth. Um, um, because he he uh, he adored her, and and she would tell you if she was here today. And I feel like that too. That Sherry's gone, Elizabeth's gone, and there was so long, so many times that it was just the three of us. And uh, and I want to speak out for him. I want to speak out how what a, what a great talent, what a great friend, what a great heart Sherry had. Um, Elizabeth, I I wanted to be Elizabeth. I told her, I said, oh my God, how nice that would be, how great. <laughs> I'm having to carry my bags, I'm driving by myself all along. And I said, you've got this wonderful man. And she's like, you have no idea. <laughs> he won't even let me go out and get pop, you know, he, because he, she, she was so very well protected. Um, so when they were having that split and they were, you know, I was gonna drive her, Vince was getting ready to really thrust her out. They we were gonna have perfume, all that. And then that, that broke, that fell. So there's a lot of just misnomers that was getting ready to happen, and uh, it didn't happen. But yeah, you bet. But should I have been a manager, or could that have been? Mm, I don't know. Did you ever have a falling out with uh, Sherry, or, what? or were you good friends when she passed? Or oh. to that? Yeah, had I, she put me on my first, on my first uh, show. Um, to get out. I had not been out in, in years at all. And uh, 2004, I went to Indianapolis, Indiana. She called me and uh, she said, you need to get out. There's a story. You know, you, they, they remember you. You need to do this. Put me on a show. I, I uh, you bet. Did I get to see her as much as often? No, but we, all, we also uh, talked about that we were going to be the Golden Girls and we were going to moved to uh, Florida and I was going to say goodbye to Tulsa, Oklahoma and she was going to say goodbye to Green Pond, uh, Alabama and we were going to be the Golden Girls and it never happened. But no, um, she, she, never, she never missed my birthday. She, I was so distraught when my mom died um, and I talked to her just a little bit but she never missed those things. And um, um, I, I can tell you that when I heard that she, I, I refused. I just didn't accept it. I, it was real hard for me to accept because she was my rock. I mean, I, she should be here at this show. You know, she should. She would always be taking care of her little ring announcer and picking me up and throwing me. You know, she would. Uh, she could do that. She did that, and she protected me. She really, really did. But I, I miss her. Bad. I, we can. We used to joke, and Dave Hebner. I love him dearly, but we always talk about Sherry. But uh, she was good to me. Never had a, oh God, no, never had a falling out, ever. No, mm -mm. <laughs>
So I'd already gone back to the room and uh, taken all the stuff off and um, the big hair was gone. And I said, come on, let's go. You can have a drink. We'll, we'll watch out for you. And I knew that, that it'd be in good hands. So I thought. So in Detroit, there's pretty well uh, no holes barred that I learned. Um, they set me down in a booth and I kind of looked and they were all over. They were spaced out and I can name some names. Um, but they, nobody was with anybody doing anything wrong. They were just being boys. Although I wondered why they weren't sitting in the booth that I was, and all of a sudden this gal just, I mean, she had nothing on. She just had just stilettos on. She comes in, and again, we're in this round booth, and she's bought and paid for by my lovely contemporaries, naked. And I mean, remember, I'm sitting, so I'm coming in contact with, she's naked and standing there. And like, <laughs> so they're having a blast to see how I'm going to handle it. And I, I just asked her, I said, if. I said, if you know anything, I said, uh, if you can get me a drink, I'll get you out of this deal really quick because I don't want you, you don't want me, but you're being bought by those idiots over there. I mean, you know, I, and they just had a big laugh and all I wanted was a drink, but I was, again, you know, let's see how Mike handles this. And I would, I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> and so they'd all laugh from her, from, and Kurt was a, a dear, dear friend, uh, Hacksaw, all those guys, but, uh, they thought, well, they didn't have anything, I guess, no other entertainment except bring their little announcer out to uh, make fun of. But they were good to me. You know, again, they never, got me, they never let me get in a, in, a, in a bad way. And in fact, if somebody did come up to me, those guys were on them. I mean, if I, I, that's why I said I'd never... Is there anybody that you want to single out as being protective or looked after you particularly? No, it was probably, probably a big group. I mean, even from... Uh, it was a, even from if I'd board a plane and uh, uh, Haku uh, would see that maybe I got overlooked and I didn't get the yogurt or the banana of the day, and he would he would notice and he would say here, and would give that to me. So yeah, but they you know they had to be very careful to not let you know the other boys see, you know that they were too kind to me. And as it came on, you know, when I first came along, they wanted to make sure you know nobody carried my bags, nobody did that. I didn't ever ask for any favors. Um, but, and I've said it so many times, and I've worked for people in public office, I have never been around more worldly, um, great people than the boys were to me. And they were, they were gentlemen, and I can imagine, I used to wonder about, I think, oh my God, what those poor wives go through and think, oh yeah, if they only knew. You know, it, they, they were very, and I would tell them, I said, you've raised them well. well they're trained pretty good, you know, they, they've been, They've been pretty good to me, but they were, they were very good to me, including Vince. You know, I, I mean, we came through a period where um, they were talking about sexual harassment and uh, Linda was very worried about it, Linda McMahon, and uh, she goes, well, Mike, do you feel threatened or anything? And I said, my God. I said, if it wasn't for sexual harassment, I wouldn't get compliments in this world. At least, and that's true, you know, if they could say, hey, you're looking hot out there tonight, and, and, and that's what they would do, and that meant everything to me because I was a part of them. And uh, uh, yeah, and I said, Linda, don't take that away. You know, because it wasn't offending. It wasn't, they never said anything offensive to me whatsoever. Vince included, and whatever that thing is on the internet. First of all, let's make this clear. I am. I'm, well, hold on, because yeah. a lot of people were not right here looking at the internet. And so one of the things that's listed on even your Wikipedia page mm -hmm. is that it was reported by Penthouse Magazine that you left WWE because of, uh, you're, you refused some sexual advances from Vince McMahon. Well, I refused penthouse is what I did. Um, and basically, and Vince, you know, knew about it and it was, it was up to me, but um, I had two small children and the, the money was incredible and would have been great, but I turned did, them down, but Vince did, never did. did. Did Vince, do you think Vince would have been supportive of, of you uh, being, having a pictorial in penthouse or? Uh, yeah, as long as, you know, you could put WWF out there, WWE, WWF. But I think at the time, probably not so much um, because we were even covering up Sherry in some of her wild outfits. Um, he just said, use good judgment. And, and I didn't even really, I don't think it was even a, an issue at the point that um, was there, I didn't there, want anybody to see any of Would there have been a number, if the number would have been a little higher, that you just couldn't have said no to, or was it just immoral? Oh, I, the, the number was, was, was terrific. So why did you say no? Moral. I mean, I, I, you have to think also to, 
there is life. After well, as an ex-boyfriend said, everybody's got a price. I didn't. Okay. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, and I didn't um, because I had to think as what I was raised is that you have to look ahead and later down on the line again you know you've just brought up a few of my past mis and I don't want to say mistakes I did them and I've got to be very and I'm I'm and I'm I'm proud of it um, but again taking off all your clothes or doing it um, in something that wasn't tasteful and uh, um, I had, again, two small children. My dad taught me better than that, and uh, it was not something that 20 years later or something that I would wanted somebody to, to show, and uh, so no. Would have been great, the money would have been great, but again, you know, that's fleeing. You know, I, but that, that stays forever, and now with what we've got now, oh, it had been on YouTube. Sure. <laughs> Do you have any memories of the, uh, the Rita Marie controversy? She, she was a, uh, a female referee, right? just like you were a first female ring announcer, she was the first female referee and, and she said that uh, she was sexually harassed or assaulted by Vincent Mann. That's has, sorry Rita, but I think Vince has better taste than that. Um, I, 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 you know, Vince and even all the people, the television people that I, that I was around, I never I never saw, I never even, um, I mean, we used to joke about it. And in fact, I would talk to uh, Shane and I dearly respect the world out of Shane. I remember meeting Stephanie when she was like 14, but uh, um, you know, he never, never even was off color ever. Um, even in our production meetings, and we had some wonderful production meetings with the television crew and we would joke around, but uh, he was never less than stellar than a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. And I never, I never felt that way, ever. Wondered what was wrong with me. Why did they uh, move in a different direction? And uh, why, why did you, if, if, if it wasn't the sexual uh, advances, mm -hmm. why, why did you leave WWE? Economics. Um, about the time that everything was happening, um, uh, the steroid issue came into to light. Um, he was having to pull in um, a lot of things, uh, including I was given the choice to move to Connecticut or not. Um, by this time, it's 93, uh, getting ready to go to 1994. I had already been into uh, one, I had a back surgery in 1990. It was only the time that I was off from television, and uh, I had a lumbar laminectomy happen to me. Um, then I had a car accident happen to me in '92. I could understand Vince's reasoning that uh, liability. Um, he was worried about something happening more to me um, because he, he said, "You know what happens in the ring? I can't control." And uh, he said, I'm, I'm, and, and, and two, the timing of it, you know, I, I, he was trying to move me into the direction of, of finally, you know, dad had been gone since 88, this is 93. Again, it was economics, and he said, I need you to move to Connecticut. I had a doll that was getting ready to go into junior high. Um, my mom said no, she was not going to move to Connecticut. And again, I'm telling you, this small little family base, um, I couldn't leave my kids, I couldn't take my kids away and leave my mom. And it, uh, again, the, the words that my father kept on resonating back to saying, diversify, diversify, diversify. Be able to step outside of that ring, be able to step outside of that and do something else. And if you can't, you're gonna end up like the ones that I used to see as a young kid that they just couldn't let go. They could never let go of wrestling and they, you know, broken down as they may be, but, you know, be able to believe in yourself to do and take yourself further. So that was the only reason. It, it was really hard to say goodbye. I did go into television. I worked for uh, uh, Tulsa Cable. I worked in production for a while, but I can tell you that every time that I'd see an airplane and I got the traveling jittery bug, you know, it's time to leave. And I missed my, I missed, I missed my family. Mm -hmm. I, my family became, um, and then they were from the television crew to the talent. That was my family. And remember, again, um, Hulk was leaving. Um, everybody, it was a change, a changing of the guard. 
and I vowed, and I and I said I would never go to work for anybody else, and I and I and I never I never did. I didn't. Were you go. approached by WCW at any point? Um, there was there was two times that I was approached, and and I I never I never I never followed it. I was in I was doing what I needed to do is come home and be a mom, mm -hmm. and I just felt that 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 chapter had closed, so I did. What did you think? I think soon after you left, they hired Bonnie Blackstone, and it was kind of like you know, I hadn't left yet. Okay, I so, hadn't left yet. Okay, what did you think of Bonnie Blackstone? Well, you know what I thought that uh, I thought Vince was uh, doing to see who could, you know, the cream will rise and the rest will fall. Sure, it was it was very intimidating. Was it something that I again that was an avenue that I'd love to done? It's like God Almighty, let me, you know, go back behind the scenes and interview. So was that was that kind of tough? I can say a little bit, but. Um, only the strong will survive, and I stayed tough, and said, "Just, you know, uh, stay what you're supposed to do." And, and consequently, she she didn't last long. All right, give me your best Andre story. Andre? Mm -hmm. Everybody's uh, got a great Andre story. <laughs> I can't. Okay, this is even. Uh, this is when he was working for my dad. I can tell you that if he was having a good time. And uh, he bought the club, and we were at a, a place in Tulsa, and uh, there were several people. Everybody that was in there, he said, this is Andre's night. We literally locked the doors. He paid, I don't know, I, don't, I we might have got out of there maybe four or five that night. And he was just on, he had just did the, uh, the uh, Million Dollar Man, and he was, you know, Bigfoot. So we were all around, and... And of course, I was a Farrah Fawcett. I loved Farrah. You know, I don't know where that came from, but I loved Farrah, and it was like what it was like. And again, I, you know, known Andre uh, a couple of years before, and he, he, I remember all the women. He said, "Just come here." And I don't know. I, there was probably four or five here, four or five there, and he lifted all of us up, all of us up. And that was right, maybe three o'clock in the morning. But he was so happy, and he was really having a good time because he was in control. Um, everybody was happy, but to know that I was like, oh my God, you, you're not going to come here. But he always, from that time forward, he, uh, when I'd ever see him, he would always never pass me by without giving a Frenchman's kiss. And that was not like a French kiss. Um, I mean, you've got to remember, Andre's lips will consume most of your face. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, would, he, he always told me, he said, your dad's proud of you because remember that I will tell you the first time that I did do the announcing, Andre was one of those people. Mula being the second one that was on that card, and then I thought, "Oh my God, <laughs> you know, oh my God, I've got to, I'm going to announce Andre." You know, I knew them from behind the scenes. Remember that, not in the ring, and to get the hell out of their way, you know, because friends ceased. You know? <laughs> it ceased, but he, he, I just remember being picked up and looking around and thinking. You really are the real deal, Andre, and a, and a wonderful heart, gentle heart, a Lake Ribbage. Did you follow the WWF and WWE after you left? I bet, yeah, sure. So you, you were a fan of wrestling, you watched the product? Sure, absolutely. Well, don't act surprised. You no, I mean, don't. some of them do, you know, some of them uh, that I'd never understood, that, that people would turn their back on the business, and there has been few, and there has been many, um, because there's still those, people that are still in it making a living and why be better or why go out and say something bad about the product that uh, was so well and good to you mm -hmm. there's still other people in there trying to make a living um, keep your feelings to yourself and don't 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 have that uh, attitude of turning your back on it ever I, I learned that from again from my dad of, of uh, people that got that were bitter and really it wasn't it wasn't the business it was it was age or whatever that they, they had not uh, parlayed for a, a, a nut life after wrestling. So they were they were better and really as themselves. It wasn't, uh, but yet the business would take a beating or they would try to beat the business. You have a, a son that just recently competed for, what was it, a developmental yes. uh, wrestler? Yes. Still wrestles today. Tell us a little about you watching him grow up and get into the business. 
Well, let's just say that he was on the road from every chance that I got uh, when my daughter became a school age, and so at five she went to school, so max. But a lot of times that they were close by, I'd fly him down, and uh, I'd dress him up, and I told him, I said, I'm not mom. I, there's no mom here tonight. Uh, I am up there, you are to go get coffee and, and whatever the wrestlers want. So I always remember seeing the kids, you know, and they would, from Randy or anybody else, would send the kids, give them money, you know, to go get the drinks. And so they grew up, again, you know, not as children, um, but as young, young children and young adults, yes ma'am, yes sir, and a love of the business. Um, Priscilla, uh, loved it, but Max really took it on. Uh, my son uh, took on the McGurk name at the age of 18 because the name, his, his father had not been an uh, uh, intricate part of his life. Um, I had. Uh, in fact, in you know, Father's Day, I would get a Father's Day card from both the kids because they said I was the best father they ever had. But you know, that's just the way that it went. And uh, so at 18, um, he went to the judge and he asked if he could take the name McGurk because he said that had been the, the best name to him. And of course, growing up in the shadows of my dad, he was only three when my dad died, but I mean, you know, we've, we've talked about it all of his life. People have talked to him. He, he grew up seeing uh, me in this wrestling business. Um, and he wanted to carry the name on. I don't think he knew that at 18, but he was still, uh, of course he wrestled. Uh, I remember the Steiners used to tell me when I'd be on the road, they said, my God, your kid's how old? And I said, five, and I, he's, they're wrestling. I go, yeah, we start him out. <laughs> we start him out early in Oklahoma. And, he, and Rick said, he said, my God, he goes, Mike, you're going to burn him out. Consequently, about 10, 11 years old, uh, Max said, I've, I've had it. He said, I just want to sit back. He said, I'll train with them and work with them. But the, 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 the competition was so much because he, he played football, he did baseball, he did everything, but wrestling was different. And uh, it, it wasn't like Brett the Hitman Hart that he loved so much, and that is that, that he loved Brett. Um, and of course, uh, Owen, see, there was another thing. Owen, when uh, we used to travel on the road, and uh, Owen uh, would, would, would talk to Max. We would ride with Owen, a girlfriend of mine that's here, Donna. We would all be in the car, and Owen would try to train Max and tell him, he said, you know, keep your receipts and be business-wise. And so all these people that he, he, larger than life, he still does today. He was a business major, an accounting major, and uh, still saves the receipts. But he, uh, he, he, he loved it. He decided to, uh, he got out of high school. He went through college. Of course, he didn't have wrestling. But all the while, he said, I'm going to take care. He started, he started bulking up. And uh, I, I took him to Tom Jones over in Oklahoma City, and I said, work with him. Um, you know, I, I, somebody that I knew had, that could train him and, and teach him the fundamentals of working in the ring, which TJ's old school. And uh, he would, and I thought, well, this, will, this is going to be, this is going to be what's going to break it. Because if he's willing to give of his time and his money to go to Oklahoma City to train um, while he's going to school, while he's working, then, then it must be really important to him. And he did, and he stuck with it. He, he's, till this day, he trains, he, he, uh, the way that he takes care of his body, the way that he eats, my, oh my God, my dad would just, it'd be, I mean, he really, because he was a tall, skinny kid, and to see what he's done and bulk up and, and uh, you know, he, so I think that he's, he tried too young. He, I told him go ahead and, uh, and contact Jim Ross, which he did, and uh, Jim tried to talk him out of it. And I said, don't let him do it. Tell him, you, you know, you got to know, you know, if, if Jim could help him. And um, uh, Jim got him, uh, I, think, uh, I think a lot of it that Jim said, well, this is a payback to your grandfather. And he said, I don't think that, he said, the business has changed, kid. He said, I really, you really should stay with your education. That's not going to work. Because he, he graduated. That was the one thing I promised Vince. I said, both of my kids are going to graduate from uh, college, and then if they want to get into business. And he did, and it literally was when he graduated. He said, I'm ready to go. So uh, uh, he trained. He had, he had worked about a year, year and a half, in local shows. And then when he got accepted for, for them to look at, they were running a contest. So he went down there first in, uh, in May, and uh, I think they already had designated who they were going to take. Mm -hmm. 
So we went home and I told him, hey kid, this is what it's about, you know, disappointment. Within a month, they called him and uh, he was down in uh, Tampa by August of that year. Four concussions later. And literally, I, I don't think, you know, I, I trained him old school way of telling that, you know, they, they take care of you and, and um, uh, but it, it's, the money is so great and again, the years that I've been out of it, the competition is so fierce. And again, when you have that kind of money uh, to kids, they'll do anything to crawl, crawl up the ladder. And especially if, if they said, oh, you think because your mom was this, and it was especially tough for him, I think. Mm -hmm. So it, I told him, well, he still got a brain left in his head and the college education that's still in there, come back home. And uh, they, they really, after four injuries, they'll, they'll cut you. And they told him to come back. And, uh, and, and try again, and I think he said, no, that's, that, you know, I, I, I saw what it's about. I came, I saw, I looked, and uh, this, is where I'm, this is where I'm at. Because I, I, he absolutely, you're gonna get hurt now. You're really, really gonna get hurt. So his goal now isn't to become a WWE performer, but he still enjoys working on the independent he'd, scene. And yeah, he'd home. love to, as far as even when they come into Tulsa, um, is, is talk to Johnny or anybody at the town, uh, 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 he's offered mm -hmm. to uh, his services. And um, uh, they're going to be in Tulsa, the, uh, I believe, the 29th. And he's not going to, you know, now he was set to, the last time they were in Tulsa, and uh, the matches got cut, but he was all ready to go. Because there it's controlled, he's going to be okay, mm -hmm. um, he knows what to do. But I think because he was so green when he went down there, believing that he was going to be the next superstar, um, that that that's not to be. You know, there was plenty of other people that were going to. Uh, he was going to have to go through before, and and I, and I think too that he thought because of his collegiate, and that was not what they were looking for. You know, that had, that whole thing had changed. That the, they didn't want to see the collegiate. They didn't want to see the old school, and they kept on telling him, "You're not. We don't want old school." Mm -hmm. So he was very confused, um, and, and Dory uh, Jr. came down, and uh, he loved working out with Dory Jr. and, and uh, even Dory Jr. told him he said just hang tough, but it was it was it was not meant to be for him, and so he's he's now a school teacher, and then wrestling he's in Texas this weekend, so he does still do uh, in in the areas down in uh, Texas and anything else that uh, yeah he still puts on those trunks you bet he's he's. He's a, a lot of a, a big showman. What is what is uh, Mike McGurk do today? Mike McGurk sells real estate every chance she gets, um, whether it's commercial um, or residential. Um, and uh, from Tulsa to uh, Honolulu, I don't care. I'll take a reference. I'll do anything that I can do uh, and referrals. But uh, basically, I'm uh, based out of there. Um, and. Um, and I live up at the lake. I live at, uh, near Fort Gibson Lake and have a, a great, great bunch of friends out there that could really, they're, they're all rooting for me up here. They, they kind of, I said, well, I'd look at, tell them to, you know, look at this web, web, web page. And I'm like, yeah, you really, you know, some of them will remember, some of them let's, you know, get pictures for me. But uh, um, a lot of them really still um, don't correlate. You know, I've had friends that are outside of the box of, of mm -hmm. wrestling in there. They pay you. To, <laughs> people want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna There's put on a group that. of people that will honestly pay to get your autograph and take your picture. They just Imagine. can't understand it. They just they because they treat me just uh, you know brutal down there. And well, now, now they know that they have to pay for the picture, right? That's right. That's right. They got to pay for it, and that uh, uh, I am on the internet and not with animals and my clothes are on. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, but they keep me in line, and I think that was a part of it that I don't I don't ever go back and 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 I don't I don't say that. And if somebody says that, and they'll like, were you? Then I know that they're from wrestling, and or that they've they followed it. Sure. So, yeah. well, thank you so much for thank sharing you. your story with us. You, thank you. It's, it's a long story. I hope everybody's still awake. <laughs> We're all still awake. Yeah. We appreciate your time very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hope uh, I get to do this again. I've still got more stories. Oh, I'm sure you have a whole book. I uh, pretty much some that uh, you know they, that uh, we can't even talk about. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You bet. Thank you.